Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one. Joyful. Written by Nora Naya Toast. Before the day in the forest, she had run only three times in her life. It was unseemly for a fain to run. They were supposed to espouse calm and authority, and being seen to move faster than a gentle glide was a betrayal of those qualities they had cultivated for generations. She thought it silly, and had questioned why diplomats had to act this way. But the word of her mother was the law in her household. Her question stopped not long after. The first time she ran was as a child, caught up in excitement by something long forgotten. She had moved towards her mother with haste. In response, she was fixed with a cold glare and a hand on her shoulder. That was far too far. We don't run, darling, her mother had hissed. Never let others see you act so inappropriately. The excitement deflated out of the child, and she spent the rest of the day with watery eyes. That day, running was shameful. The second time she ran was as an adult, and her homeworld was torched by raiders of the north. In the face of death, her calmness shattered. She sprinted away from the epicenter of the attack, screaming in fear as buildings shuddered and fell to their knees around her. She remembered little of that day, except how her legs and feet hurt for weeks after. That day, running saved her life. A human scout ship, visiting for respite and caught up in the fighting, spotted her in a field as she outran a wall of fire. They swooped down and rescued her. The captain pulled her into a hug as the ship exited the atmosphere. She stood, wooden, unable to hug back, cry, or say a single word. For two years, she did not speak. The human crew were friendly, banter flowed between them like water, and although the fame they rescued didn't respond with words, she smiled at their jokes and pulled faces instead. When her entire race vanished, the survivors of the torching packing themselves into starships and leaving without a trace, the humans kept her ground. Over time, they became closer than family, and over those two years as they visited world after world, and introduced her to ideas and ways of life that she could never have imagined, she eventually came to trust them with her life. The third time she ran was on Earth. The humans took her to see their home world parking the ship in an area surrounded by woodland. Her and one of the humans found the captain's stash of alcohol and shared it with the crew. The entire crew was soon rolling around and giggling and making sport of throwing bottle caps at each other. Later, in the light of the full moon, the Fane woman and three of the humans stumbled out of the ship towards the woodland. Hey! Hey! Race you to the clearing! One of the humans called and took off into the thicket. One human followed, laughing, still holding a bottle of beer. The third looked at the fame woman, seeming to stare right at his soul with hazy eyes. Run with us, she said, just once. You don't have to keep up appearances here. Then she took off as well. The fame woman, tipsy and a little confused, but eager to take part in the fun, started to walk, following them. But her legs acted on their own accord, and suddenly she was running following the humans by the sound of their laughter. And as she ran through the thicket, hair catching on branches and skin being snagged by the occasional thorn, she started to catch up to the rest. As she did, they whooped and hollered in encouragement. The wind picked up, casting dead leaves into a spiral, and she felt the kiss of the cold on her face. Her breath came fast, but the world seemed to slow as adrenaline coursed through her veins. It was... At that moment, she emerged into a clearing. She was fast, faster than she had realized, and she had beaten everyone else. As she looked to the sky, she saw the light of the full moon illuminating the clearing in a glow reminiscent of her homeworld. Her world tilted on its axis. She became hyper-aware of herself. The thrum of her heart, the air gasping in her lungs, the adrenaline in her veins throwing everything she saw into sharp relief. The static in her feet as they crunched towards the undergrowth. For a moment, she swore she could feel the planet itself breathing. 
she could almost see the threads of life and fate which had pulled everything together in this moment. It was as if the veil had been lifted from her eyes. She opened her mouth, and for the first time in two years, words tumbled out. Joy and love and grief, all tangled up into syllables. That night, the human celebrated and cried as she told them about her homeworld, about her mother, and about how much she had come to love her crewmates. That day, running was joyful, and from that day, the world felt a little more colorful. After that, she ran many, many times. The crew, while on a pit stop, entered her into a marathon on a planet known as the Sea of Lilies. She protested at first, but eventually acquiesced. The captain, having long forgiven her for stealing her alcohol, put her on a training regimen. She became strong and took over much of the physical labor of the ship. As it turned out, Vane became fearsomely strong when they trained, and more than once she caught some of the crew staring at her in awe as she carried a box five times her weight. It dawned on her why her race had been so averse to his exertion. They had been afraid of frightening others, but she knew her friends were not afraid of her. Her being in a marathon was a source of curiosity and discussion. The Fane had not been seen in three years, and for one to reappear so suddenly, and in a marathon no less, was perturbing to Benny. Nevertheless, she attended, ignoring the attention trained on her by the other races, the memories of her past swiveled in her as she ran, the shame of running as a child, the fear as she ran for her life as the Fane homeworld burned, the joy of the wind in her face and the branches in her hair as she ran with the humans, with whom she now shared a bond of astonishing strength. She felt the burn in her legs and the gasping in her lungs, but she continued, determined to show this world who she was. She won! Why did you enter? One reporter asked her in the aftermath, as she held the middle aloft and was lit up by a flash of cameras. The humans I travel with saved me, she replied. They saved my life. Ah, but they saved my sanity too. They taught me how joyful it is to just, uh, let go of everything and run. She wiped a tear from her eye, then continued. Maybe my people will see what I've done someday. Maybe they'll come back. Maybe. Maybe they'll realize that they don't have to pretend to be something they're not. That evening, she received an encrypted message, its source unclear. I am proud of you. I was mistaken when I told you your actions were inappropriate. She would cherish that message for the rest of her life. End of story. Story number two. The Lost Song, written by a glass of whiskey. In summary, the ordering of the planets forms a secret message, no doubt left behind by some immensely powerful ancient being. Today I've deciphered and shown that message to you. It had been a long presentation, but he felt he nailed the finish, although the last half an hour was more of a mixed result. Loud snoring from his only audience member was a large part of that. It had really screwed up his rhythm. Yes, yes, you're a nutcase, said his still slightly dazed audience. He had woken up to the sound of air horns, some kind of demonstration on how messages could be stored in short and long blasts of sound. Those long parts had really made an impression on him. The audience member continued, Already knew that. Got that memo and the presentation, unfortunately. You can stop with the sales pitch and the air horns. Just tell me, why are you here? There was some scraping of hooves. Uh, need to borrow your spaceship. No, you don't. Remember what happened the last time? Come on! Oh, that, that was one time. Wanted to watch a supernova, was it? Did a bit more than scratch the paint, frankly. I'm surprised you even survived. And now you want to do it again? No, no, didn't you listen to a word I said? Ancient civilization! Secret message! Come on! Right, and no murder bots this time. That hardly ever happens. Twice. It's happened twice. With a deep sigh, he took a look at his crazy friend, then reached deep within and found forgiveness, in the hope 
that he might get to witness his friend making a very large and silly fool of himself. Fine, I'll let you borrow my spaceship. Oh! It had been an unlikely victory, but a fine one. But I'm coming with you, and I'm playing what? But, but what if there are murder bots? Yeah, this time we checked before there is murder bots there. Not after landing and seeing them scramble all over the ship trying to get in. They walked to the spaceship and prepared the necessary supplies, such as snacks. All right, let's go. Where is this place anyway? I just showed you on this chart over here. Uh, look, it's here. Looks like a bit of black to me. Of course it does. It's in the middle of space. So most likely this is just a space trip to the middle of nowhere. We will find nothing before going home. No way! Ancient beings, code. There's a 110% guaranteed chance. 110% guaranteed chance later. Right, now we are here and there is nothing. Uh, can we go home now? You need to reduce your velocity a little bit to the left. Okay, done. Now we are still in the middle of nowhere. Can we go home now? Wait just a minute. I think I'm starting to hear it. Hear yeah, what? The song. That's what we're looking for. The code talks about some strange song. Oh, you're just, uh... Hey. You're right. Yeah, you're, you're actually right. You don't need to sound so surprised about that. Shh. Let's just listen. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.